And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for your own health and fitness. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman. Jeff Fawcett and I come to you weekly with a critical, independent voice on the politics and practice of health and the environment. The telecommunications industry and other advocates of wireless technologies claim that the non-ionizing radiation emitted by those technologies can only cause harm through their effect in heating tissues. Those limits are well known, they argue, and the technologies are manufactured and their use regulated to stay safely within those limits. Critics have argued that there is ample evidence of harm from exposures significantly lower than current standards. Scientists who support the industry and other wireless advocates argue that there exists no biological evidence to, of harm and that, in addition, there exists no plausible physics to explain any such connection of harm to non-thermal, low-energy radiation. As regards a biological effect, there exists an extensive scientific literature on the relationship between the radiation emitted by wireless technologies and illnesses such as lowered fertility and neurological diseases such as Parkinson's disease. Now there's a growing scientific literature on the physics that explains how non-ionizing radiation has the disruptive damaging effects described by biological research. My guest today is Martin Paul, which is spelled P-A-L-L. He's a Ph.D., professor emeritus of biochemistry and basic medical sciences at Washington State University and author of Explaining Unexplained Illnesses and the article Wi-Fi is an Important Threat to Human Health from the journal Environmental Research, which we'll be discussing today. Last time we talked about threats to health from 5G, we didn't have time to talk about the mechanisms underlying it. That previous show is called How Dangerous Is Non-Ionizing Radiation? Although I don't want to get too involved in recapitulating what those harms are, if you could just summarize what the concerns were in that regard, the message that you were sending in that paper that we discussed last time as to what those harms are so that people listening will get an idea of how broad the scope of this problem is. 
What I've been doing most recently is I, I, in my talks, I first of all start talking about eight different types of effects, which are extraordinarily well documented based on anywhere from 13 to 35 different published reviews that show that they're occurring following uh, EMF exposures. Uh, those include widespread neurological and neuropsychiatric effects which are becoming increasingly common in all of the technologically advanced countries on Earth. They include reproductive effects, lowered male and female reproduction, increased spontaneous abortion, decreased levels of each of the three types of sex hormones and lowered libido, and all of those things are going on. In terms of male fertility, there are multiple types of effects that impact male fertility. So we have those, we have oxidative stress, which is involved in essentially every chronic disease you can name as a, as a major causal element. We have attacks on the cellular DNA, the DNA of our cells, of three different types, which are involved in producing the, the most important types of mutations that we have in human genetics, but also in terms of the most important changes that occur to produce cancer. And we have also increased levels of what's called apoptosis, often also pronounced apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, which is uh, something that's very important for producing the neurodegenerative diseases and also uh, the reproductive effects that we talked about before. Then there are also uh, many different hormonal effects. And then we have uh, 35 different published reviews showing that EMFs cause cancer. Which is one of the things that, that came to me as I was reviewing the paper you had sent me, mm -hmm. is in the discussion of DNA damage, of course, where everyone goes to immediately is, oh my God, mutations in cancer. Mm -hmm. What occurs to me is that there is a much more mundane kind of damage that's being done here, that DNA is involved intimately in the production of proteins, including enzymes of all sorts, and proteins that serve constructive functions. Disruption of that process may not have the dramatic effect of cancer, but it affects virtually every process in the body. So that, yes, cancer is of concern and it, and it frightens people, but there's much more mundane things or, or mundane problems that have their origin in the generation of proteins from DNA, which, if it is damaged, gums up those works. Am I, am I leaping here, or is that a, a, an accurate description of the role of DNA and the role of damage to DNA? Uh, yeah, I, I think you are right. I think, the, you know, the reason that we tend to focus on cancer and on reproduction Yep. is because there you're talking about the essential roles of individual cells yes. in the process. So if things get messed up, they can have major effects simply based on a particular mutation in a particular cell. The types of things you're, you're discussing are things where, yes, there will be a degradation of the function of cells around the body, but the, <laughs> the roles in individual cells are are minor, but the, the cumulative effects may be substantive, and that's exa I, you know, I, I think that's what you're getting to. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, on to the, the issue of the mechanisms, which is what I really want to discuss with you today. Mm -hmm. The thing that you have written about recently, which I think is of major interest in terms of explaining why EMF has the effect that it does in such a broad range of things. And it has something to do with something called voltage-gated calcium channels. Because this could be a little obtuse to most listeners, what I'd like to do is unpack just what those things do, and then we can talk about how they are effect affected. So to start with, what exactly is a calcium channel, and what does it do? The ones we're talking about are found in the plasma membranes, the membranes that surround each of our cells. These are channels that can open up and allow calcium ions to flow into the cell. The reason that you, you I'm talking about going into the cell as opposed to out of the cell is because the concentration of calcium outside cell under typical conditions are about 10,000 times higher than the concentration in the cells. 
when you open up the channel, you get huge amounts of calcium that can come into the cell. And obviously, it's important for the cells to keep calcium levels low under most conditions. And otherwise, they wouldn't be spending huge amounts of time and energy keeping calcium out. And so calcium does flow into cells normally under certain conditions when you're, when you're uh, trying to regulate things with calcium. But this is a very short-term thing, and then, it, and then the excess calcium gets chucked out. The effects of having too much calcium in the cytoplasm are, are major, and that's why uh, when the EMFs cause such large increases, they can cause many, many different effects. The influx of calcium ions into, into a cell, the actual effect of that, or ultimately a physiological effect from that, will depend on the kind of cell that it is. It's not like calcium triggers some uniform thing. It depends on what the metabolism of the cell is. So it depends on whether it's a liver cell or a heart cell or a lung cell or so on. Is that correct? Well, it's true in some areas, but not in others. One of the important changes that occurs in cells when you get excessive calcium is that you get excessive calcium signaling. And the function of calcium signaling in different cell types is often different. So in that sense, what you just said is is correct. But there are other effects that occur that are actually in, pretty much in common among different types of cells. Specifically, when you get excessive calcium in the cell, you also get a, a large elevation of both nitric oxide and superoxide. And these two react with each other to form something called peroxynitrite, which is a potent oxidant and which breaks down to form reactive free radicals. And those can act in a number of ways to produce uh, oxidative stress and to produce increased inflammation. It's those free radicals, by the way, that attack the DNA of our cells. And that's how we get the DNA effects. You, you get many effects from, from the oxidative stress. And so proxy nitrate's been studied extensively, thousands and thousands of different studies. So we know what, what it does. And, and the effects are similar in different cell types, but that doesn't mean the consequences are always similar because, you know, obviously some functions are more important in some cells than in others. So anyway, that's, that's a sort of a general thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, part, part of what we're trying to do here is give people a, a very clear picture of the mechanism of how you get from mm -hmm. EMF exposure and electromagnetic exposure to physiological effects, because that right. has been kind of one of the fundamental arguments against the fair amount of evidence that suggests that there is a relationship between non-ionizing exposure to non-ionizing radiation and a wide range of health effects, that these are non-thermal effects, they don't heat, and uh, there is no known or no generally accepted mechanism from just a physics standpoint that could cause a, a biological effect as being described, so that this description of calcium channels and, and the effect of EMF on those calcium channels is the connection between the physics and the biology. Yes. Well, I mean, I agree with your last statement. I don't, I, um, okay, so let, let's talk about the voltage, the voltage-gated Yeah, the voltage-gated, yeah, the, voltage the, the voltage-gated part. So, so these are channels which are, are open, which open up in response to changes in the electrical charge across the plasma, plasma membrane. And so, uh, and so they're particularly important in electrically active cells like our nerve cells and muscle cells and and endocrine cells and some others. But they're also important in other kinds of cells. So they're they're found all over the place. And uh, I don't know of any cell types that don't have them. But what do we know about this, uh, about these responses? First is that a wide range of electromagnetic fields, ranging all the way from the millimeter wave frequencies that will be used for 5G, if we go ahead with the craziness of putting these 5G in. The uh, microwave frequencies uh, that are found in most of our wireless communication, uh, radio frequencies, 
intermediate frequencies, extremely low frequencies like we have from our power wiring, 60 hertz in the U.S. and 50 hertz in, in Europe and much of the rest of the world. Even static electrical fields and static magnetic fields, they all act to activate these voltage-gated calcium channels, which I abbreviate BTCCs. So this is truly extraordinary because you're talking about a huge, huge range of EMFs that work in this way. And the basic, the, the, fun, the most important type of evidence which shows this is that you can block effects, and most of these are done in cell culture, by using calcium channel blockers, which are drugs which are specific for blocking these uh, BGCCs, these voltage-gated calcium channels. And there are a whole series of other types of evidence which argue that this is a direct effect on the VGCCs and that these things are acting directly on it uh, through a structure in the VGCCs which is called the voltage sensor. So this is the structure which detects the electrical changes across the plasma, plasma membrane in the normal physiology. And I've argued, and this is based on the physics, that the forces of the, the DMS place on the voltage sensor are absolutely extraordinarily strong. They're approximately 7.2 million times stronger than the forces on singly electrically charged groups that are found in the aqueous parts of the cell and where most of the charges are. And so this is the reason why these VGCCs are so sensitive to these extremely uh, low-intensity EMFs. And so, so that you know, the industry has been claiming, oh, these EMFs are too weak to do anything other than heat things, and we, and so you shouldn't have any non-thermal effects. But the reason the industry is wrong is because of the extraordinary sensitivity of the voltage sensor to the forces of these EMFs, and that all comes out of the physics. You're listening to your own health and fitness. I'm Jeffrey Fawcett. I'm talking today with Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, about how non-ionizing radiation from wireless technologies disrupts our biology and damages our health. Yeah, it's remarkable. Uh, it's, uh, it's this uh, profound multiplicative f- effect of getting from different, s- of just basically how the how the channel itself, how the ion channel itself works, Mm -hmm. that you get to that $7.2 million multiplier from inside to outside. I have to ask, what what has been the response to this uh, argument? Are we still in the phase of just simply being ignored, or is anybody trying to rebut it? Because that's kind of the stage things go through. First you get ignored, then they say you're crazy, and then they say, well, we knew that all the time. So I know we're not in the third phase of, yes, we knew that all the time, but Mm -hmm. is there any inroads in terms of recognition of this powerful effect in the literature on this? Yes, there is. And in fact, it's been surprisingly rapid, given how slow things typically are in science. So let me just say, the first paper that I published on this was published in in, uh, 2013. That paper was honored by being placed on the Global Medical uh, Web Discovery site as one of the top medical papers in 2013. So that was an important type of recognition. Yeah. At this time, there are approximately 190 papers that have cited that paper, and this is an indication of widespread interest and acceptance in the scientific community. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's accepting this. Um, I'm not going to tell you that. But I think there has been a lot of acceptance of it, and, uh, and it's been very heartening. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, the industry accepts it. The industry has been very quiet about this up until recently. They've basically been trying to ignore it, hoping it'll go away. But now I've been seeing that I've been getting attacked in various ways not always on the VGCC mechanism, sometimes on other things. But I am seeing uh, more attacks. But, you know, that's what the industry has done. They've attacked every single scientist who's who's done very important work on on EMF. So it's not surprising at all. One of the things that interested me that I would like to hear more about, if we know about, is that you you mentioned other ion channels that potentially could be affected, sodium channels, potassium channels, chloride channels, that calcium is not the only ion channel that operates 
within cells. It's part of the communication system of environment to cell. And so I'm wondering what the implications are for the, or what we know about these other cells. Is the potential there for having as profound an effect? My understanding is that calcium channels are far more pervasive than these other channels, but nevertheless, uh, is is it just calcium channels that are of concern here, or should we be concerned about those other ion channels? Well, the channels that you're talking about are all voltage-gated. Channels, yes, okay? right. So they all are regulated by a similar voltage sensor. And so there there is published evidence that the um, sodium channels, the voltage-gated sodium channels, potassium channels, and chloride channels are all activated by the EMFs. And uh, there's also evidence, which, which I've published on, that, that the, in plant, uh, there's another set of channels, which is often abbreviated TPC channels, which have a similar voltage sensor, which appears to be the primary target in plants. And, and this, the, the plant channel also works primarily via calcium uh, effects to produce calcium effects. So then, then the question is, how important are these non-calcium right. uh, channels? And the evidence that's been published so far suggests that they have roles, but they're minor role. And so to a first approximation, I think we can ignore them. And in addition to that, the, the, the sodium channels, which act to uh, depolarize the plasma membrane, actually may act indirectly to activate the calcium channels. So the calcium channels seem to be the most important parts hmm. of this story, and that's probably because of the great importance of calcium in the cell and the great importance of keep, keeping calcium levels low in the cell. And the fact that you not only have a 10,000-fold concentration gradient driving calcium into the cell, but you also have a huge elect electrical gradient driving calcium into the cell. And the combination of the two is over one million fold. So you have a you have a huge, huge force driving calcium in the cell when you open those channels. I think, at least to a first approximation, we can explain everything or almost everything based on calcium alone. That may change over time. We may see more evidence for important effects of the other channels. But at this point, I think uh, you know it's calcium channels that seem to be the most important. And that's, I think, very clear. I take it from this, since we've been talking about calcium a lot and, and uh, with regard to scary health effects, that mm -hmm. the, the implication here is not that this has anything to do with having too much or too little calcium in your diet. The problem is not the presence of the ion per se, it's how your cells, how the, the ion channels themselves respond to exposure to an EMF. I just want listeners to not hear, yeah. I'm taking too much calcium, I'm not taking enough calcium, I'm overloaded on cal you know, that kind of thing. That's not the problem here. The problem here is that what calcium is there and what your body can scavenge in terms of the calcium ions is being misused, let's say because of the EMF exposures. The, the situation is it's the intracellular calcium that's yes. important here because it's excessive. And generally, the extracellular calcium is regulated by the uh, parathyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. And so it tends to be kept relatively constant. That doesn't mean there is absolutely no effect of extracellular calcium, however. It, it, there may well be a, a, a minor contribution here of extracellular calcium, but the major effect is the activation of the uh, VGCCs, the, these voltage-gated calcium channels, and not the uh, concentration of calcium outside the cells. But there may be a minor effect of that. So I'm not saying excessive yeah. calcium intake is totally benign. Uh, it may not be here, but uh, but it's not the major cause. It's similar to the situation of, we come across it in issues surrounding osteoporosis and bone health and so on, that you mentioned the parathyroid and mm -hmm. also the presence or absence of things like vitamin K that help regulate calcium metabolism. So it's not whether you're taking calcium supplements or not. I mean, that's an issue to evaluate separately, but the issue here is that the calcium metabolism is what the, pro what the problem is, not the absolute amount of calcium ion 
that's what I want people to hear. The issue here is the exposure, not the availability of calcium or lack of availability of calcium. I would like to have you talk some about the issue of how we get from acute to chronic health effects from EMS. One of the things that I think gets a lot of people involved with this issue is they have acute effects, Mm -hmm. uh, categorized as electrohypersensitivity, typically. What you're describing is there's substantial evidence already and a growing amount of it that these conditions caused by exposure to EMF is irreversible, is cumulative and irreversible. So how do we get to there from what seems like a physics condition where you have an exposure, which is the electrical or the electromagnetic field changes? So if you just turn off the electromagnetic field, doesn't the health threat go away? (laughs) Yes, okay. Um, Let me answer your question in two ways we have, I think, good evidence that the effects on, of EMFs on brains, both animal brains and uh, human brains. In human brains, we're talking about inferences based on changes in the, in the, the, uh, the neurological and neuropsychiatric effects. That in the, in the brain, that, that these things tend to, in most cases, start out very slowly and initially without any obvious effects, and then they, they, they tend to accumulate over time to a particular type and level of exposure. They tend to get more and more severe with time. So initially they're quite modest, and uh, both the animal studies and, and, and some of the early human studies showed that when you have modest effects and you stop exposures, they actually can reverse essentially back to normal. If you keep doing that, the effects get more and more severe. And then at that point, if you uh, if you stop the exposures, they seem to be uh, permanent. You you don't see any obvious reversal back to normal. When these things were studied in animals, the structure of the brains became highly aberrant as the exposures times got longer and longer. And so you you saw. major disruptions of both the structures of the individual neurons and the structure of the brain tissue in a, in a broader sense. You had a lot of apoptosis, programmed cell death. You also had a lot of disruption of the synaptic connections between the neurons. So here you're looking at major changes in the structure of the, of the tissue that seem to be very important in, term, in, in uh, causing these uh, changes to become irreversible. You see very similar things within the reproductive effects, again, that were studied in animals. You see changes in the structure of the, both the testis and of the ovaries in animals. And again, things start out very slowly, and then, and then, uh, and then at that point, uh, things seem to be readily reversible when they're relatively modest. But as you see changes in the structures of those of the testis and of the ovaries in animals, uh, these things tend to become irreversible. So the, these uh, kinds of uh, what's sometimes called tissue remodeling changes are involved here. And, uh, and I think there are other changes that occur also, for instance, in, in, the, in the cardiac effects, which we haven't talked about that are somewhat similar. And, of course, the mutational effects are inherently uh, cumulative and irreversible. So those are things we can understand at that kind of level. But then there's EHS, and EHS is more complicated than this. (laughs) Electrohypersensitivity is EHS. Yeah, electromagnetic hypersensitivity is EHS. And and there, I think, uh, you have quite a number of regulatory changes which occur that also appear to be sort of vicious cycle changes where you, you see long-term changes which are not easily reversible as well. These things are complex. When I say they're irreversible, that doesn't necessarily mean they can never be reversed. What I'm saying by that is two things. One is that they don't reverse spontaneously when you take the exposures away. And the second is that conventional medicine doesn't know how to reverse them. Those are the two criteria that I'm, I'm using to say that they appear to be irreversible. 
One of the things that also occurred to me reading this, and you you alluded to it uh, about cardiac effects, is that I may be off here, but some some years ago I came across a, an argument that something like three quarters of a million people died unnecessarily, unexpectedly, as a result of taking a diabetes drug. Uh, the diabetes drug is sulfonylurea, or it's a class of diabetes drugs which, that stimulate uh, uh, endocrine pancreas to produce insulin. Mm -hmm. They discovered that its effect was through the stimulation, activation of calcium channels on the what are called the islets of Langerhans, which are the mm -hmm. beta cells that produce insulin. But they had the side effect of mm -hmm. overactivating cardiac cells, mm -hmm. the, the, the pacemaker in particular. And so someone did a calculation that said, well, given the you know number of years that it was done and whatnot, so, so many people died. The number of people who mm -hmm. died unnecessarily is another thing. But the phenomenon that you're describing and the role of calcium channels and how they are, uh, to use a highly scientific phrase, mucked up by mm -hmm. ex environmental exposures is not novel in our knowledge of environmental health. Mm -hmm. Is what you're describing something that, that is going to have potentially cardiac effects or effects like that, that it, it could be killing people, but not in ways that no one has even speculated on yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not to send everyone running for the exits, but have we got a phenomenon here that we've seen, a kind of thing we've seen before, and it's kind of right next door to it. Only instead of drugs, it's uh, cell phones that's causing these aggravations. I think you're absolutely right. In fact, my analysis has been tremendously dependent on all of these studies on uh, calcium effects and on the roles of specifically of voltage gated calcium channels. It's just simply how you explain these effects. It's actually very easy to explain these effects because we know so much about calcium and we know so much about the voltage gated calcium channels. I'm going to take a brief musical break. When I come back, I'll continue talking with Martin Paul about how non-ionizing radiation from wireless technologies disrupts our biology and damages our health. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. You are in the right place. This is Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Jeffrey Fawcett. I'm talking today with Martin Paul about his work on how non-ionizing radiation from wireless technologies disrupts our biology and damages our health through the mechanism of voltage-gated calcium channels. Our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, has more information about this show, as well as our almost 700 other shows, a free download of today's show, free open access to recordings of all our shows, a free newsletter about upcoming shows, and more at yourownhealthandfitness.org, where we also have a link to Martin Paul's article, Wi-Fi is an Important Threat to Human Health. Back to something you mentioned earlier, which is the connection of what's called the no-oh-no -oh -no cycle, with the effect of calcium influx or elevated calcium on production of nitric oxide and a process that you also originated, uh, did a considerable amount of work in, in highlighting and bringing to 
the attention of the scientific community Mm -hmm. having to do with two things that are are quite relevant here. One is that environmental exposures can lead to a broad range of chronic health conditions through that mechanism, that no-oh-no cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is in conjunction with the direct effect of calcium influx through the calcium channel effects from EMF exposures. The interesting thing, or from my standpoint, an interesting aspect of the no-no cycle is that it kicks in an imbalance so that one explains the transition from an an acute condition to a chronic condition because Mm -hmm. the body is unable to respond to it. What it brought to mind is a phenomenon in um, environmental health called toxicant-induced loss of tolerance, which is a phenomenon observed with people who have been exposed to pesticides, for example, who have perhaps a mild reaction the first time they're exposed, but subsequently become terribly reactive to any kind of chemical exposure. So it's that issue of how do we get from an acute response, you get exposed to a wireless technology that gives you a headache, and so if you turn off the wireless technology, everything's going to be okay. But other processes may be kicked in that will put you in a chronically challenged condition. Back to the no-oh-no cycle and how that is a second arm of this argument as a result of calcium influx. So if you could say some more about that part of your argument. Yeah, obviously I agree with you on this <laughs> because I've been working on that yes. uh, for a long time. Most of the work that I've published on this has actually stayed away from talking about the, the no-oh-no cycle. And the reason is that a lot of the things that that are occurring can be explained more simply. But as you uh, just raised, this is almost certainly part of the reason why things tend to be chronic and tend to be uh, irreversible and uh, an important part of that. Um, so let me just say to your your listeners that the no-no cycle is a complex biochemical vicious cycle, which I posed initially in one form in the year 2000 and then later on in a, in a more complex form uh, in around 2006-2007, that involves a lot of different changes. And so it's based on multiple regulatory interactions. And it's basically a complex vicious cycle, which once it gets going, tends to go on its own. So that when you have stressors that start this cycle, they are the initial cause. But the stressors can go away and you still have the illness, and that's because the cycle then is the the current cause. By the way, the, the most extensive evidence that I have published that a particular disease is caused by the no-no cycle is a 57-page paper that I published on heart failure. So it's not just the the brain related effects, but there are other effects that that can be caused by this cycle as it's localized in different parts of the body. I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question now, but um, oh, oh no, you, you're answering the the question. This is the focus of it: that to point out these things are connected, and that it makes perfect scientific sense to argue that an acute exposure can lead to chronic health effects. This is not, Mm -hmm. this is, no one should be surprised by this. The attempt by industry and their supporters in the scientific community to dismiss this is just irresponsible, if I may say so. Well, obviously I do agree with that. (laughs) Let me, let me just say something about EHS. I, previously had worked on multiple chemical sensitive sensitivity, MCS, which also has a different name, which you were using, uh, toxicant induced to- loss, loss of tolerance, yep. that's caused by chemicals. And the chemicals also act by excessive calcium in the cell, but mm-hmm. they act through a different pathway. They, they act through uh, excessive activity of what are called NMDA receptors. And oh. these, are, these are things that open up a cha- another channel, mm-hmm. which... Uh, which allows calcium to flow into the cell. But the VGCCs are much more widely distributed than the NMDA receptors, which 
tend to occur mainly in the nervous system, but not only. There are some differences here. I argued that, that with regard to multiple chemical sensitivity, that the, uh, that the main effects were what happened sort of downstream of excessive calcium in the cell. And that you get the you get the um, the no no cycle going, and that uh, that then produces the main effects, and that that I think is 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 probably true. Um, what happens? And so I was mostly emphasizing sort of downstream effects, things are that are produced as a consequence of these changes. Um, excuse me. Uh, so I think that um, <laughs> what's true about EHS is, <clears throat> based on the best available evidence, is somewhat different, and that is it appears to be the case that in EHS the the VGCCs themselves become hyperact hyper uh, sensitive to stimulation. Wow! And uh, and. Uh, the first, the first type of evidence that um, that I don't know whether I should go through this. Uh, I, I was contacted by a, a German physician, uh, Dr. Cornelia Baldmann Selsam, who told me about one of her patients. That, uh, and I, I won't spend the time to tell you about it, but she's given me permission to talk about this. This patient clearly shows that uh, that. Her VGC, she has extraordinarily uh, EA, uh, EHS, very high sensitivity, that um, when she's exposed to extremely low levels of EMFs, uh, the extracellular calcium actually plummets in her body. Um, hmm. I just talked to another EHS person just, um, oh, I don't know, about two weeks ago, I guess it was, uh, who told me something that was, uh, somewhat similar um, about her experience, and so um, I think that I think this is true. I think that I think the the actual the VGCCs themselves become hypersensitive to stimulation in uh, EHS, and uh, and there are, there are some other unpublished observ also unpublished observations that suggest that uh, that that's true from some other studies. Um, so you do get, I believe, no no cycle effects, uh, and one of those effects is actually that the uh, the VGCCs themselves become hypersensitive to stimulate. Back to calcium channel blockers, I wanted to be clear: this is not a situation of lacing the water supply with calcium channel blockers. That's not the solution. Reduction of exposure is the solution. Nevertheless, it brings up the question of how do you get some method for reducing the sensitivity of those mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. chemical structures in the membrane of, of the cell? How do you calm those things down? Or do we have any hints as to how to calm those things? And clearly, this physician mm -hmm. you're talking to would like to know the answer to that question. Yeah, as with right. A patient. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, let, let me just say, you know, uh, you know, one of the questions that's been raised, and I think you, you're... you're uh, raising this question in your own in your own discussion is are the calcium channel blockers useful in in treatment of EHS and I, I have to say so far I haven't seen any evidence that it is I'm not sure that the right studies have been done to mm -hmm. actually test whether it is but you have a fundamental problem here and that is that the the VGCCs have very important roles in the body, so you can't just block them, you know. Uh, and yeah, so, right. uh, you know, the, so you have all kinds of, you know, what are called side effects when you use these things. And they are used in some situations clinically, but the question is, is this one of them where, where they might be used? And that's, the answer to that's not clear, and, and certainly there's no, there's no good published evidence that they are useful, but that 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 may change at some point if people figure out you know a way of doing this that would help uh, with the problem. Um, having said that, I think that um, there are a number of ways in which one may be able to 
um, lower the uh, the uh, activity of these PGCs in, in EHS. Um, one of them is to take um, magnesium supplements, um, and uh, magnesium supplements, I believe, are mostly useful not because magnesium and calcium uh, sort of inhibit each other's activity, which is what a lot of people have argued. Uh, some people have argued, well, magnesium makes a peak with calcium for, for intake into the cell. I don't think that's right. But what I do think is correct is that a very large fraction of our population is magnesium deficient. And uh, because, because our, our diets are low in magnesium, because of uh, various things, we eat processed foods, we eat uh, we, our, our agricultural soils, uh, have often been depleted uh, of magnesium, and so we have, you know, we have problems there with uh, low magnesium. So uh, it turns out magnesium deficiencies lead to excessive activity of both the VGCCs and also the NMDA receptors that we talked about before. So those are problematic, and I think that calcium, or sorry, magnesium supplements can be useful. Uh, by lowering uh, the hyperactivity that you will already that you will otherwise see, um, there, there's a, there are also other approaches that can be used. And let me just say, before I go on here, I'm a PhD, not an MD. Nothing I say should be viewed as medical advice. Um, and um, but one of the, one of the things I think is useful is that there are a number of uh, of uh, agents, including nutritional agents, that uh, we know raise an important regulatory system called the called NRF2, N-R-F number two. Um, and I, I, I published a paper on NRF2 in 2015, which your readers can access just by putting in my name, Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, and NRF2, N-R-F number two. Uh, you know, so NRF, no space, two. And, uh, and uh, you know, you can find it and, and download it off of PubMed. And uh, what, this is an extraordinarily regulatory, uh, regulatory system which, which lowers um, essentially all of the no cycle that we talked about before. And uh, it's been reported that several uh, agents which uh, which uh, which are known to uh, uh, to raise nerve two can be helpful in terms of uh, uh, lowering uh, EMF effect body and uh, so uh, so I think that you know you can look up that paper and you can see a number of things that uh, that are known to uh, to uh, to, to uh, raise nerve two and and uh, and some of those, at least, uh, can be useful in terms of treating uh, these sensitivity conditions, including EHS, I think. And uh, anyway, um, so that's, again, this is not medical advice. The last thing that I'm interested to know about is you cite several scientists. You have a section where you talk about other people who are working to explain what's going on with EMF exposures and their relationship to these chronic health effects, well, acute and chronic health effects. Uh, but uh, what I wonder is, where is this contrary research coming from? You're the only American that I know of that's publishing extensively on this. How how are they able to get this research? Because one of the one of the things very noticeably that happened I don't know, 20 years ago is that the research money for this issue in the United States shut down. So how is it possible that research is going forward in this and other parts of the world? You know, what you say about research funding in the U.S. is absolutely correct. The research funding, and I've, I've documented this in a... In a uh, Actually, chapter six in, in a ninety-page document that I've written that's on the internet. Um, you know, research funding was cut off uh, initially in 1986 uh, by two, in two organizations, uh, government 
organizations in the U.S., and then subsequently there were other shutdowns in late 1994 and uh, and then in 1998. Uh, and so we don't have any government funding for research in these areas uh, at this point. Um, and so, you know, so nobody's working on this stuff. I mean, anything that, that you know, that... Uh, uh, that one can do that requires funding um, simply cannot be done in the U.S. Uh, there, there is some funding that's available in some other countries, and there, and the, and a lot of the, there, there's still, you know, some quite good research going on. Uh, that's going on. A lot of it's going on in places that you wouldn't think it would be going on. Uh, like, for instance, Turkey and Iran are two of the countries where, which have a fair amount of research going on. Uh, there's also country, uh, uh, research coming from from Europe, and that's coming not from the U.K., but from other countries in Europe. Um, and, uh, uh, and you know, there are countries in East Asia that are producing good research. There's India is producing some good research. And there's, you know, occasional papers coming from... Uh, uh, a number of other places like Brazil and uh, um, I am trying to think uh, uh, in in the Middle East. You know, you have you have uh, things from Saudi Arabia and Egypt and uh, and uh, and Israel and uh, uh, so you know. The, so there are you know there 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 is good research going on. It's not coming from here, and and the consequences of that is that. Where the U.S. government has been, for instance, encouraging the um, uh, the proliferation of cell phone towers all over the place, so we have well over 300,000 cell phone towers all over the country. There's not been a single study of, of uh, health impacts of people living near cell phone towers being done in the U.S. They're all coming from elsewhere. And... Uh, you know, and similarly, the the proliferation of uh, of of, uh, of smart of uh, cell phones, including smartphones, uh, all of the studies on genuine uh, cell phone radiation are going on have, have been published elsewhere. Um, and similarly, all of the studies on genuine Wi-Fi have been published elsewhere. So we take great pride in our science, and we are absolutely nowhere in this area in science, and it's a, it's a disgrace. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's horrendous. Um, anyway, I, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but that's. A... Oh, oh no, that, that answered the question. I regard it as disgraceful. I am surprised that there isn't as much research elsewhere than there is, but it's heartening that there is. My hope is that listeners have been informed enough to become increasingly concerned about exposures to this. So if there are any last thoughts you might have that you'd like to share with them, please do so. My three top concerns with regard to the human impact of the CMF are, number one, the neurological and neuropsychiatric effect. And these include effects on the kinds of effects we see or can't sleep, tired all the time, I'm depressed, I can't concentrate, so you have anxiety, depression, all these memory dysfunction, changes in the sensory organs, all these uh, neurological things are going on, and they are all getting to be more and more and more common, not only in the U.S., but in every single technologically advanced country on Earth. And they are, as I said before, uh, probably a consequence of an underlying changes in the structure of our brains that, that's that been studied in animals in great detail that's produced by these uh, low-intensity EMF exposures. And those are cumulative, and as I said before, uh, as, they, as they become more severe, they become irreversible. So this is already far along, and my concern is that we will have a crash in our collective brain function within, and this is a very, very rough estimate, within something like five to seven years, based on the kinds of exposures we already have. If we go ahead with 5G, that will be, in my judgment, absolute total disaster. If we continue to increase exposures from things like radar and cars and from 
uh, from a large expansion of 4G and, and various other things, this whole thing will be greatly speeded up. My prediction is very simple, and that is when we have a crash in our collective brain functions, we will see complete and utter chaos. I think it's inevitable. And that's the direction we're going in based on the best available evidence. You know, we're already seeing that people who are highly exposed are having lots and lots of problems. Whether it be airline personnel who are exposed to high levels of EMFs in airplanes, partly because of the Wi-Fi, but partly because of radar and various other electronic devices. We are seeing this, I think, with police who, who are exposed to very high levels in police cars and police stations. We may even be seeing this in politicians who use cell phones for many hours a day. So there are lots of things that can happen. And let me just say, in the population, there are neurological, neuropsychiatric effects that occur in people who live within 300 meters, about 1,000 feet of a, of a cell phone tower. A very large fraction of our population lives within 300 meters of a cell phone tower. So we're, we're doing absolutely extraordinary things. And, and, and the risks we're taking are way, way, way beyond what any kind of rational society can possibly take. Okay, so that is neurological, neuropsychiatric effects. Let's go on to reproductive effects. We talked about what kind of reproductive effects are seen before, and uh, those are already far along in our populations, as best we can determine. Sperm counts have dropped below 50% of normal in every single technologically advanced country on Earth. Reproduction has dropped uh, well below replacement levels in every single technologically advanced country on Earth, with a single exception. You know, I've been predicting for a while that we will start seeing crashes in reproduction because of an animal study that was published over 20 years ago in mice, which showed that EMF uh, exposures uh, well below our safety guidelines lead to an immediate drop in reproduction. And within uh, 90 days to 150 days, produce a crash in reproduction, essentially to zero, with no recovery or almost no recovery when... Uh, when exposure stops. Those things, as I've already stated, they, they tend to accumulate over time and they tend to uh, become irreversible as they become more severe. Are we looking at a crash in human population? Up until recently, I would have said I haven't seen any evidence for it. Now I think we're starting to see evidence of it. The best evidence is two East Asian countries where between 2016 and 2017 there was a huge drop in uh, reproduction. Singapore, which is a very densely populated, very high technology country, had a drop of 31% in reproduction between 2016 and 2017. Macau, which isn't really a country, but where there are statistics that are set, kept separately as if it were a country, had a drop of 26%. Another very high density, very high technology place in which there's a lot of gambling, and those gambling machines may generate a lot of EMFs as well. And, and then the third example was South Korea, where there was a drop of 11% between 2016 and 2017. That was despite the fact that the Korean government's been trying to increase population, increase birth rates, because they know their birth rates are very low. So all three of those countries before these drops were among the lowest reproductive rates in the world. They were sort of vying for the lowest, each of the three, in the entire world. And now they have just had a, a huge drop. And in South Korea, uh, the, there's data for the first six months of 2018. They've had another roughly 9% drop. So I think we're starting to see the crashes. I can't say that for certain. I can't even tell you for certain that these are caused predominantly by the EMFs, but that's the obvious interpretation. But what I can tell you for certain is we are taking absolutely extraordinary risks that no rational society can possibly take. My third concern has to do with the, the DNA effects in, with regard to mutation, and we've already talked about those. I don't know how far along we are on those. I simply haven't found any good data that allows me to make any, any conclusions about, about what's happened to the human mutation rate over the last 15 or 20 years, which is what we need to know about. That's another major concern, but there I, I simply can't tell you that we're far along. With the other two, I think we are already far along in this process. So I think we're looking at imminent 
crashes in reproduction. I think we're looking at imminent crashes in our collective brain function. And we may be looking, may or may not be looking at imminent large increases in mutation frequency. You're invited to see the award-winning documentary film, A Dangerous Idea, Eugenics, Genetics, and the American Dream, featuring Robert Reich and Van Jones. Three screenings will take place in the Bay Area, Tuesday, April 23rd, at the New Parkway in Oakland, Wednesday, April 24th, at the Smith Raphael Film Center, Thursday, April 25th, at the Delancey Street Theater in San Francisco. All venues are wheelchair accessible. All screenings will be followed by Q&As with the filmmakers. A portion of the proceeds benefit Paragon Media, a 501c3 Bay Area nonprofit. For more information, 